Um, hi everyone, my name is Mandy and I'm a software developer and I work for a company that makes um, semiconductor photonic um, simulation software which has nothing to do with machine learning. Um, but about one and a half year ago, I started to learn more about machine learning. And very recently, I got a GPU machine, which is not very high end, but still <laughs> usable. And um, so I started to um, try out some of this um, Kaggle competition. And today, I'm going to go through with you uh, with one, um, of one of these competition. Uh, and it's the IMAT collection 2019. All right, just a little bit of an outline. So we're going to um, have a competition overview, and then we are going to talk about the problem that we are trying to solve in this competition. And then we'll talk about the search of a solution, um, what most people do when they try to tackle this problem, and what the winning solution is. And then there will be some um, final remarks. Oh, also, uh, I wrote this presentation in a little bit of a tutorial style, so that by the end of this, you should be able to participate in this competition too. Yeah, hopefully. And you should be able to get a rank of maybe like 350 out of 400, which I think is not bad if it is just your first time. Okay, competition background. So um, the host of this competition is, um, is the sixth workshop of the fine grain whistle categorization at this conference, um, CRPL 2019. And CRPL stands for Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition. And I heard that this is actually a very prestigious conference, but I have never been there. And um, for this competition, the data is provided by the Metropolitan um, Museum of Art in New York. And the subject of this competition is their collection. So there will be a, a lot of pictures of their beautiful artwork. Sorry. <laughs> it works a little better with the cat. Oh, okay. Um, oh, yeah. sorry. It's okay. Well, you can, can you see it on your screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So um, a little bit about the match collection. Um, they have um, about 1.5 million objects, and most of them are paintings, sculptures, and also some furniture and like photos, jewelry, and things like that. There's also a patio, which I thought is really interesting because this patio, it has like balcony and windows and like a whole garden, everything. And they just moved that patio from Spain all the way to New York and put it in a hall in the museum, which I thought was pretty cool. But um, that picture is not in the training data. So, And um, other than that, there are about 2, uh, 200,000 um, imagery of these objects, and they are all available um, in their online catalog, which you can check out um, on that link. And this is a screenshot of that online catalog. Okay, so the problem, so what are we trying to solve um, in this competition, which I think it is always very important when we um, tackle a competition, we should know exactly what we are trying to solve. Okay, so, so the problem statement. So what we are trying to do is, if I give you a photo of like one of the artifacts um, from the museum, will you be able to um, tell me something about this um, artifact? So say for this sculpture, um, as a regular, I mean like a common um, um, museum goer, I don't know anything about art history, so I will probably guess, oh, um, this might be a Greek sculpture, and this might be a Greek goddess, maybe like Athena or someone else. So. The challenge of this competition is to figure out um, an algorithm when you input this picture to this algorithm and the algorithm will be able to output some attributes, some labels that would describe this object. Okay, now we will jump right into the training data. So um, the training data we have um, about 100, uh, over 100,000 images. And all these images, um, they have multiple labels. And there are 1,103 different labels. And these labels fall into two different categories. One is culture, and the other one is tag. Are we good so far? Awesome, okay. So just to give you an example, so again, back to our sculpture. And it turns out this sculpture is Egyptian. And it is a goddess, and it is Aphrodite, which I think is Venus in Greek. And there is also um, a label or hat um, attached to this picture. 
So I'm guessing there is something interesting about the hat from the art, art history perspective. Just one more example. So for this um, plate, um, it has these labels, um, dishes, horses, children, and men, because this page um, has the um, 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 picture of those objects on it. And then there was also two labels about culture. One is Italian, and the other one is Urbino. So um, for the labels, there are 398 culture labels, and these are just some of the examples. And um, attic is actually a Greek culture. It's not the attic, like, you know, house or anything. And American, uh, Edomite, um, Italian, Spanish, those are cultures that uh, we all know. And there are, there are 705 um, labels. Like, most of them describe the objects in the picture, like um, fairies, TKD. Um, but some of them also describe like, maybe like a situation like daily life and drunkenness. So some of them are more abstract. Okay, and then we'll look, more, look deeper into the data. So um, each image, it will have at least one label, but most of them will have um, two to five label per image. And the image that has the maximum number of labels, it has 11 of them, but that's just like a very rare cases in this data set. Um, an image may not have a culture labels, but most of them will have at least one. And then um, an image also does not have to have a tag label, but most of them will have at least one, and sometimes um, about one to five, I guess. Okay, I'll get the questions going. Um, this might be a little bit uh, too late, but uh, do you have any idea what like the motivation uh, for the competition was? Like, what are they trying to achieve with mm -hmm. these with these labels? Actually, I thought about it really hard because when I look at their online catalog, it seems they have everything sorted out already. So um, when you look at the online catalog, when you choose an object, it will have like really detailed description of what that object is about. So why do you still list this competition, right? So um, I read through all the overview and everything. It sounds like they want to make search easier so that like maybe if this image has like a plate, then you can use it to find another image that also has a plate. That would be one of the, their motivation. But I think their major motivation behind is they want to be able to more fine-grained um, attribute um, recognition. And maybe that's why they put this, um, they partner this with um, the workshop. And I think the difficult in that would be um, they want to be able to look at the image and identify something um, more abstract, maybe the culture of it and things like that, that those things would require expert to do, but can a machine to do it? I think that would be their motivation, but that's just what I think, but I am 100% sure. Any other question? Okay. Okay. Oh, beautiful work, Carl. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, on that last slide, uh -huh. it said 1 to 11, any labels? What is, and what is that? An image could have one to eleven any labels. Culture or tag, so it's either like, for example, if you have like one can culture, one. Like I think it means uh, culture or tag, right? Yes, so, culture if, or tag combine. Combine. So it's like uh, there is no there is no um, picture that doesn't have any labels. Like mm -hmm. each picture at least has one culture or tag label, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And then if you have, for example, like three culture tags and one label, one one tag label. You have four, any label in total. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So um, now we look at um, the um, occurrence of these labels. And this is uh, how often an label is attached to an image. Um, so it turns out that um, for culture labels, um, French has the highest occurrence, which I guess kind of makes sense because French has a lot of artwork, <laughs> and um, there is also um, Italian, American, British. These are like very popular culture that, that we all know and love. But then there are also some slightly more obscure ones that we, we may also be um, kind of familiar, like Bohemian and Dutch and Greek and Islamic, Iran. So I really like this work, Carl. I think it is very pretty. Um, any question about? 
Oh, okay. So what this implies is it, this is a very imbalanced data set because some labels has a lot of images, which means it has a lot of data points. And some labels, they only have like, they are only assigned to one image. And I think those labels will be like pretty much not identifiable, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And then for pet labels, the highest occurrence is men and women, and somehow flowers and utilitarian objects, those are also very common labels too, and birds and leaves and such. Oh, and the least uh, common one is Mark Anthony. You probably cannot see it, but it is done at the bottom of the list. I'm guessing it's a sculpture of him or something. Okay, so problem formulation. There are lots of ways to tackle this problem, but because this is a machine learning competition, so we'll use a machine learning problem formulation. So, um, so what is happening is we have to um, create these models so that when an image is input to this model, it will be able to assign high probability to this label. So if we take a more detailed look of these labels, if we just look at these four, four ones, um, they're actually just objects on that image, like there's a horse on the dish, and that's why it has a label of horses. And therefore, for this label, these are just, I want to say simple, but these are just the good old object recognition problem, which is a problem that has been solved um, quite effectively and efficiently um, by, many, by many people since image lab. So I think this is actually the easier part of this problem. And I think to identify the culture of an object is actually much more difficult. And I would consider it more as a fine grained attribute recognition problem. I was still good. Okay. So for the evaluation metrics, um, I guess, um, okay, so it is, um, so usually for this type of um, uh, classification problem, we will use the at one score, which is just the harmonic mean of precision and recall. And F2 score is a very close cousin of F1 score. It just put more weight on recall. So in this competition, we are using F2 score. Okay. Hey, well, I've come to the search of the solution <laughs> very quickly. And uh, okay, so first of all, I'm going to talk about how most people would approach this kind of problem. And I think pretty much for any image classification problem, they would, people would go through all these three steps. Um, first of all, they will apply data augmentation to generate more images to give yourself more data. And then they will try to um, use some pre-trained model, uh, modify it a little bit so that it will fit um, the problem that you're trying to solve. And then you will build an ensemble. And this day, it seems the most popular ensemble is the stack model. But real data scientists may not agree with me, I know. Is that model very popular? Okay. So data augmentation, um, simple concept. So you have an image, and then you manipulate a little bit. You may shift it, rotate it, change the brightness. Um, that way you will have create more um, relevant data so that you can use it to fit into your model. But what is the... Um, um, what is the reason behind this? Why would that work? Because if you, wouldn't that be noisy data compared to traditional algorithm? Traditional algorithm, we consider those data noisy data, but not a convolutional neural network. Uh, so um, th this is a very, I mean, pretty good article to explain like, why this would work for a, for a convolutional neural network. Okay. Okay, code. So uh, because I like to use Kira, so um, this is just some code that you can use to do data augmentation. Yes. Uh, okay, I have a few questions about the evaluation metric. So um, can you like, um, explain the, the major differences between the F1 and F2 scores? Um, uh, why putting weight on the recall is better than... So what are the benefits using both? Is it F2 score over F1 score? Yeah, yeah, just like the, the I think like the kind of exposition of that part. Okay, So okay. make it clearer. Oh, sure. Oh, okay. So um, in any classification problem, 
um, there has to be a trade-off between precision and recall. So if you want more precision, you will have less recall. If you want more recall, you will have less precision. So sometimes um, when, when you want both, you will use uh, at one scope because it's a, a harmonic mean of this thing. Harmonic mean is just like geometric mean or arithmetic mean. It's just the average of two things. And we use harmonic mean for ratio, and that's the reason behind at one score. Is that good? Okay. okay. So for F2 score, for this problem, I don't know. People are having a little trouble hearing. Can, can you unclick the mic? And um, would you just be able to just hold it? You know, it's, it's a little far from you. Yeah, just like that. That'd be great. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so F2 score. Oh, okay, for this problem, somehow they decide that having more recall is better. So they give recall more weight. When you look at these two equations, they're actually very similar. It just, it just give um, more weight to one than the other, and that's it. So, F1 score, harmonic mean of the two ratio. F2 score, more weight to one of the ratio. Good. Okay. And... Keras. Um, anyone else use Keras? Keras? Okay, it's popular. Yeah. Um, so um, to do data augmentation is really easy with Keras. So um, unless you want to do something very unique to your problem, otherwise if it's just shifting or rotating or zooming or changing brightness, that kind of things, you can just use their class uh, image data generator. And you can, um, in their constructor, you can design what kind of um, augmentation uh, you want to do to your image. And then you can just use their method to tell the generator where the source images are going to come from. And then you can just, e you can just input the whole thing to the model. So nice and easy, I think. <laughs> uh, OK, uh, train the zoo. Um, this part. Um, I guess um, other machine learning problem will will do this. Do will do transfer learning to you, especially like NLP and such. But um, this is really crucial in imaging because uh, in machine machine because there are some really um, efficient, uh, effective uh, pre-trained models out there to tackle imaging problem, and those models are very expensive to train. Like Google may be able to train one of them, and we like I. I just have an RTS um, 2060, and I will not be able to like train um, one of those models. But the good news is we can we can still use those models. We just have to um, um, apply a technical transfer learning, which is use the model, but um, add a few layers at the end of it so that it become tailored to your problem, and then train that model. And that model will become your base models that you can input to an ensemble. Wait, uh, I just have a question. So, is this is this computation uh, without internet, like the without kernel? internet? Yeah. Yes. Um, external data is not allowed, but um, pre-trained model that are open source they are allowed, and oh. only from certain um, repo too. Yeah. So it's a kernel competition. Okay. Now I'm just wondering. So how they're just like part of a library, huh? the pre-trained models. Like, how do you get them? Um, so there are a repo called Cadence. There are lots of them, but I don't know which repos are allowed by this competition, but there are at least. Oh, okay. And even um, Keras itself has some um, p train models that you can use, which I'm going to explain in the next slide. Yeah. Okay. okay, transfer learning with Keras or Keras. Okay, so they have this module called Applications, and it has a bunch of um, pre-trained models in it. I have a feeling they don't have the newest one, but they have some like uh, good old ones like Restlab, Inception, and VGG16, and such. And you just have to pick one, and then... Okay, so for the ways, you can use um, other ways, but um, this library provides um, different kind of ways, too. And you can also download it from a repo. And so you can use the ways, and then... You can decide that you want, if you want to use the entire pre-trained model and then attach um, custom layer to it, or you can actually retrain part of the pre-trained model. 
So let's say the pre-train model has like five layers. You can freeze the first three and retrain the last two during your retraining. Okay. And for this very simple example, um, you add um, a fully connected layer at the end of your pre-train model, and then add another fully connected layer, um, which will um, output the probability of your label. And this is like the simpler case, simplest example to do transfer learning um, with Keras. Yes. Um. So I'm not familiar with applications.inception resnet v2, but I've noticed that the, on the second line there it says include top equals false. Mm. Uh, by my understanding, that would be the final layer of mm. the inception resnet, which, is, which would be just the classes inside of ImageNet. Mm. So I, is there like a thousand, a thousand classes or something? Mm -hmm. Uh, I noticed you said include top equals false. Okay, so you're dropping that final layer, mm -hmm. and then you're gonna put in. Okay, is there a, is there a, is there any idea of whether that's always a good thing to do, or maybe you want to have, use some of those weights? I have never seen a sample that would say include top equals true. They always drop it, and. I don't know. And also, different models will be different too. Like some models, when you say include top is false, it actually drops the top three layers instead of the last one. Mm. So it depends on the models. But yeah, I cannot think of one example why you would um, use transfer learning while including the original top layer. But then these models, they are not just used for transfer learning, right? You can just use it directly for image classification. If the problem you are trying to attack, um, attack is close enough to the image lab problem. Okay. Oh, I thought there was a question. Okay. Okay. Uh, focal loss. Um, this is the most commonly used loss function in this competition. And usually for a image um, classification, uh, actually, sorry, not image classification, for a multi-label um, classification problem, the default loss function will be um, binary cost entropy. But, um, so um, what is focal loss about? Focal loss is actually just a variant of binary cost entropy, but it gives um, easy samples uh, a smaller weight. So what are the easy samples? Easy samples um, a sample that um, has a very high probability. Say if a sample is like 0 0.999 to uh, has a probability, probability of 0 0.999 to um, belong to class A, that, that's an easy sample because it's too easily identified. So um, if you use focal loss, um, this law function will, get this, it will, it will give that sample um, smaller weight. And according to the creator of this loss function, that will alleviate the problem of class imbalance. And as we are, have already went through a um, couple of slides before, this um, problem is, um, uh, has um, um, the, the labels are highly imbalanced. And there is actually a very good explanation of first loss functions, and you can check it out on that link. Yes. So would that mean that it's going to focus more on the classes that are uh, less uh, seen inside the data? Uh, yes. Um, or more difficult or less likely to, to be assigned to. So the likeliness comes from like the occurrence, like the, the number of those occurrences you have, or is it like combinations? Because this is the multi-class... Um, can you ask me again? So, like, how do you how do you um, assess uh, the low likeliness of oh, okay. something occurring? So, uh, I should uh, I should have write down the equation. <laughs> so, basically, um, are you familiar with the um, binary cost entropy equation? Somewhat. Yeah. Okay, so there is a p, right? Uh -huh. So you just um, multiply one minus p to it. So it's like 1 minus p times log p. So if 1 is very close to p, then it has a smaller weight. Okay, yeah. So does that mean that if the model gets it right when it was a 50-50 chance, we tell the model it did a really good job? 
I don't understand the question. What is it? Well, if it devalues getting when it knows it's right, we devalue it and give it a lower weight. Yes. It's under- Doesn't that mean we tell it it did a really good job when it guessed? Well, you can think of this two way. Um, are you familiar with um, other booths? Other booths? Are you familiar with the algorithm other bo- other booths? Ah, uh, okay. The so- guy who slept with his mother. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, no. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I have another example. Uh, let's say um, object detection. Um, uh, focal loss is often used in object detection too. So let's say you have a picture and you have two cats in it. You want to be able to identify those two cats and find the location and everything. And one difficult thing with object detection is it has background. And background, most of the samples of the image would be background, right? So you have a lot of background and it will be an easy class. When, um, when the image try to identify a sample um, to see if it belongs to one of the cat, cat A, cat B, or belongs to the background, most likely it will say it belongs to the background because there are just a lot of them and it kind of mess up your loss function. And another thing is um, CNN has a tendency to um, bias towards um, the majority class. Yeah, so in that case, what can you do? Whenever um, you identify a background, you give a smaller weight and say that it is not likely to be a background. Maybe it's cat one or cat two, or cat A or cat B. A little bit kind of intuitive, but yeah. Yeah, I, I thought it was a little bit kind of intuitive too. But apparently it works, and, and go check out that article. Pretty good explanation too. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. So I, I said uh, at the beginning, um, by the end of this presentation, you will be able to participate in this competition, right? And so there are actually um, a lot of, like in all Kaggle competition, um, within the first month, there will be a lot of starter code that you can, um, you can fork from and do your own thing from there. And so these three starter code, they use um, data augmentation and then transfer learning. So those two boxes are there. And then people just publish them so that other people can um, develop their own model based on this starter code. And uh, one of them, the easiest one, um, is the first one. And it has a final score of 0. 0.488. And the winning solution has a score of 0. 0.7, 0. 0.672. That's just to give you a context, like how good this starter code are. Okay. Are we still good so far? Oh, we are at the final stage. We are building the staff model. So uh, we just finished training all those um, pre-trained models, right? And those models uh, for each image that you give it will output some probability of labels. So we would take all those probability and put into a um, input vector. And you can add other um, features to it too. So this whole vector, you're going to pass it to a classifier. Um, so that it will tell you, like, um, according to that input vector, um, which label will have a high probability. And usually the classifier would be a, a, like a gradient booster tree or other kind of tree ensemble. And I think a couple of months ago, um, HGB, which is a library for um, gradient booster tree, was like hugely popular. And it seems that nowadays I see more LGBM. Okay, we have finally come to the pipeline of the winning solution. And what he does is actually um, still based on the same pipeline that we just went through, but he does a little bit more. And um, I'm going to go through it um, step by step. So uh, when training the pre-trained models, it had, uh, actually, okay, before that, um, to further tackle the problem of class imbalance, um, so it sample each um, image, uh, it assign a weight to each, um, actually no. Okay, it sample with a logarithmic weight. Basically, um, if a class is, um, has a lower occurrence, it will have a higher weight. So this is a way to um, tackle um, imbalance issue. And then we'll go ahead to um, train all those pre-trained models. And in the first iteration, after he trained all those models, 
uh, he would draw images that has a very high pediatric error and consider them noisy. Okay, yes, he has a question. I'm just noticing that some of those models are pretty heavyweight, so I was wondering what sort of resources they allocated for these kernels. I actually, I'm going to go through it um, in the final remark. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Also, okay, that's a very good question. Yeah. So if he's dropping images, does that mean that he's not trusting some of the data? Like, yes. what did, was, the, was this a conversation in the forums a lot, that there's lots of mislabeled data? Yes, that's what he thinks, yeah. Uh, thanks for explaining it for me. <laughs> and oh, and there's actually a term for dropping labels to, uh, I mean, dropping data points to, it's called um, negative mining, right? Negative mining? Okay, <laughs> okay, so that's the first iteration. And after dropping the noisy images, it will train the model again. So after the second iteration, it will apply pseudo labeling. What it means is, let's say I have this image and according to this model, this intermediate model that I have, I think this image is going to have a bird in it. But somehow, according to uh, my training data, this image doesn't have a bird. But I will trust my intermediate model and say that this image has a bird. And I will put this data sample back into my training data and retrain the models. So, and this technique is, is called um, pseudo labeling. So, after these two um, iteration, I basically have uh, all my modified pre-trained models ready. And one final step is um, because um, the author of this solution, he thinks that um, the culture label seems to be really noisy, but the tag label seems to be quite consistent. So he added another model to train, um, to train the tag labels only. I don't understand what the second iteration is trying to do. Seems like the, the second iteration, which is like oh. you apply your labels into your training data again. Yes. Seems like it's actually taking the model away from what it's supposed to be doing, no? Yes, but this is, yeah. Um, yeah, it seems counterintuitive, but it's actually a pretty common practice. You have something to say? Yeah, pseudo labeling is most often applied to images that you don't have in your training set. So the images that you're trying to predict on, you can you can use your model to to give those labels and then to feed those back into your training set. So you they increase your total training size. I think that's what that's how I've normally seen it. Oh, crop image. So it, does this relate to the fact that you are um, cropping and morphing and, and changing your image in some ways to increase your... No, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Okay. Uh, what I think what, what's happening here is that um, because all of these images, they're basically tagged by people. And some people are lazy. They don't put all tags. They just put one, like whatever. Um, they can see the bird in there. They can see like you know some some animals or whatever. Like even when there was example of um, uh, rarely used labels on the very bottom, there was like slavery and prostitutes. And you know, looking at twenty thousand examples, like from from previous centuries, can you imagine how many examples of slavery we would see? Right. So I think that. Um, what they are trying to do here is actually uh, predict some of the labels that are obvious. Like, it's just people didn't put it there, but it's like obvious there is a bird, there is like slavery or something like that. And they basically enrich that um, training set by doing that. It's just, you know, fixing human errors kind of thing. That's my, my understanding of this. That's a very good explanation. I didn't thought of it, but. I think it's probably the case like some annotator they are lazy and they didn't put in all the labels. Yeah, it's it's actually interesting in this competition because this is a multi-label competition. I th I think you're right. I I, I think they go and re they can even relabel some of their examples in the training set, right? Um, so usually they don't do that in the training set because usually 
most of these competitions are like each each image has one class only and you're not going to change that class necessarily because then you're just going to be you know the model is just going to be learning itself um but if it's a multi-label sense i guess you can go and change your training data yeah so, i have a question at the very end the Hi. Um, so this is kind of a, a noob conceptual question. Uh -huh. um, if you've got missing labels like that, uh -huh. and like the the model is is looking looking at the image and seeing a bird, but the bird label isn't there, uh -huh. is the model learning this is what not bird looks like, or is it only kind of like a, a positive thing where you only it only learns what is there in the labels? That's a very hard question. Maybe Matt can answer it for me. <laughs> well, I'm definitely no image expert, so um, if there's somebody else that has an idea, I mean, yeah. neither am I. But like my take on this is basically it learns to if it's if you identify a bird in something that's not labeled as a bird, then that helps you better identify a bird in all of the images that does that do have birds, because it gives you like a, a greater training sample for that label. Yeah. Right. The theory makes sense to me, but why you would want to have the label? I'm just curious on a conceptual level, is it is the model learning like is it see, like it sees all the image and it thinks this is what not a bird looks like? Maybe it's irrelevant. <laughs> uh, okay, so the exact example can we get a mic up here as well? So the exact example that you brought up is there's an image where there is a bird in the image. But the label says that there's zero. There's not a bird in this image. And now, yes, I think she. Well, she's nodding. Yeah. Um, so basically, when you look back at the our um, evaluation score, like our precision recall, like precision is like basically getting all of the ones correct and not getting them wrong, or like not like missing them, and like recalls like getting them, and it doesn't care if you if you add, get extras that aren't there. So like. Talking about like the bird, like we because in this competition we want to increase our recall of, like for some precision, so we want to be able to find all the birds. And if we get a couple wrong, it's not as big of a deal. Um, so that's probably well, that's part such a of good it. explanation. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Mm. But um, what I was going to add is that there isn't a tag for not bird. There is only an absence of a tag for bird. So we're not training that there is no bird in the image. We're just saying we haven't seen a bird in the image. But that's yes. a very good explanation too, because a CNN is there to find what is there. Is it not there to find what is not there? And it will create feature maps, and this feature will be things that it finds. It's not a map that of things that it doesn't find, right? Right. Well, I would argue against that point. If I mean, if you have a zero for bird, then you are telling that you are telling the model that there is no bird here. Um, if you have, so let's say your model is developing features to identify bird, and then it runs across this example where it's like, oh, hey, there's probably a bird in this image because it's matching this feature that I found, and then you tell the model, actually, there's no bird here. That's actually going to go back and it's going to really hurt the model's ability to develop that feature. And so you are hurting the model's ability to identify birds by these examples where they're mislabeled. Um, conceptually, that's how I view it. Well, I think that you're right. Uh, and there is also the additional um, kind of condition that um, it, it will add those pseudo labeling only to most confident predictions. So you can actually put that, you know, mm -hmm. lever and just say like, I'm, I will put that label if I'm 90% sure that there is a like this uh, specific feature here. But uh, what I was uh, thinking about is like uh, when we discuss the pre-trained models and how you, in Keras, you basically drop the top uh, layer. And like you couldn't think of any examples where that would be apply applicable. I think that in this competition, you could actually try to do that with the top. So you take ImageNet, you take the predictions from ImageNet, and then you can try to identify tags just based on uh, that output, based on uh, the labels that 
original model provides with uh, all the features. So let's say if you see uh, a bird and then, I don't know, a woman and, I don't know, like a sculpture or whatever, uh, I did identify by ImageNet, you can actually say, well, it's probably like from, I don't know, Greece or whatever, right? So you can actually train on the predictions, not on just image characteristics of that, but on the labels themselves. Well, it's just a thought. Um. What you said actually are nice with what the author of this finished solution think very well, and which I will, I'm going to explain in the next slide. So I have just one last thing I want to okay. uh, know, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so my understanding is that we are doing that pseudo labeling because we are already very confident that our model can detect objects well because it's already a pre-trained model. Mm -hmm. um, if, 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 for example, I, I do a model of my own and it sees a, a bird in in a bunch of grapes, mm -hmm. then it's I'm, I'm actually like ruining my whole training with be doing something like this, right? It'll label all grapes birds. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you are right. Yeah, if you are training your own four-layer models, then maybe don't do that. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, there is one more question at the end. I know we've already discussed this a lot, but one thing I just wanted to add is another reason that you might want to do this in this particular case is because um, if you're using the focal loss um, to well, um, evaluate your your model. Um, then, basically, what that does is it it makes the largest corrections when you're the most wrong. That the focal loss um, basically amplifies the, the corrections that it makes when you're you're far off the off the mark, and then um, dampens them when you're close to, to the right prediction. So, in this case, if you don't do this, then there's going to be like large changes introduced into the network by these things, which you're pretty sure it's actually getting right. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. I didn't think of that. Very cool. Uh, okay. I'm glad that has started so many discussion. So maybe the next slide will have some more discussion too. Okay. Now, um, so they have, uh, so he has all these models and the probability from those models, and now he's going to build um, a stat model using those base models. And of course, he's going to use the probabilities from the base model and what else. So there are additional features, maybe like um, brightness and, and mean and mass of each channel from the images. And then one more thing is the prediction from ImageNet which is exactly uh, what you said. So um, it is his observation. And actually, it was my observation too. A lot of the labels, the classes, is actually very similar to the classes of image lab. And um, in the previous slides, um, I mentioned that if you look at those, um, one of the example, you can see that four of the labels that identify um, horses, human, and such, the object in the images, um, that problem can that is actually, that problem, um, that would be half of the challenge um, in this competition, right? And that problem can be solved very well using um, image-led um, solution. And this is what he did too. He used prediction from the image-led um, as, um, as another features and input everything into a LGBM, which is um, uh, a gradient booster tree. So... Yeah, yeah. You should have participated in this competition. <laughs> uh, okay, so that was that. Uh, and final remarks. I didn't forget your question about those heavy duty network. But first of all, um, so this is uh, the uh, author of the winning solution. He was he actually was very nice and wrote a pretty detailed um, summary of his solution. Um, and the score was 0 0.672. And this is um, um, the score um, versus ranking from the um, private leaderboard, and it is all finalized. And just to motivate you guys a little bit, like if you just use the starter code, and you will be like, you will end up like around here, which is like not bad because many people they are at zero. <laughs> and this is a good starting point. And say if you use the starter code, like how can you um, climb up the leaderboard? Well, 
um, by studying the winning solution and also the top 10 solution, uh, we can see that um, careful data engineering would be like, actually I, was not, I wanted to say clever, but careful is good too. Um, clever and careful data engineering would be a key to it. And then better selection of pre-trained models. And yes, like you said, these are heavy data models, but why does it matter? Um, okay, so uh, this is a kernel competition, right? So in a way, um, it leveled the playing field for everyone. So even if you don't have the hardware, uh, you can just um, write some really smart algorithm to train your model and just, just send the code um, to Kaggle and let them run it for you and train it for you. So it seems like it leveled the playing field. But the thing is, you always have to do hyperparameter tuning, right? And that's where you have to use your own hardware. And if you have like a super machine, you can try out more hyper hyperparameters to find the optimal values for your model before you send it to Kaggle to, um, to let it run it for you. So in that sense, um, it is still unfair, but uh, it is what it is. Um, yes, did I answer your question? Okay, he has more question. <laughs> This is completely unrelated, but um, you've talked about the winning solution. I was wondering what your solution was like. Uh, I didn't participate. Oh, okay. <laughs> but next time, I yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, and also always use ensemble model, and it seems like that will always help. And that's it. Oh, by the way, just one. Oh, oh you don't have my. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I have my. I have one more slide at my own PowerPoint, but it's okay. It doesn't matter. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, we've got time for some questions. Oh, is it? it is on. So I have a question about. Um, did anyone use very simple models and got very good uh, results? I mean, something without so much uh, computational resource usage. Something of like, in a model that's not so complex, but ends up doing well. Was there any of such in the discussion? Uh, I think he can answer for me, so okay. <laughs> It's a more general question. When was the last time we saw a Kaggle competition that had a, you know, a single simple solution that didn't have an ensemble of massive uh, machine learning algorithms just thrown at it, throw the kitchen, throw everything in the kitchen sink at it, and eventually you'll just tweak the better solution? Yeah, actually, some people actually get some like um, one simple model of some forms, and they say this is my best single model. Uh -huh. But maybe they let I assemble other other stuff for some. Minimal I just remember that getting things. first place. Okay. Well, actually, yeah, I, I think you're right. Like, I was hoping that there would be like a more elegant solution to this problem too, because I think um, people that um, has a very high score on these competitions, um, clearly they're very smart and they work really hard and do really careful data engineering. And I, I also think they play to the fact that these labels are easier to identify using pre-trained models. And they didn't try as hard with the culture labels, which I think would be harder to identify. But it's just my guess. Maybe they are really good at identifying culture labels too. Yeah. Yeah. So what I was thinking about with that question is it's image recognition is pretty much a solved problem. Um, you're not going to probably get a new really simple approach come in and, and easily sweep everything away. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're when you're given pre-trained networks to start from, mm -hmm. um, you re it's actually kind of a simple solution just using a pre-trained network and just letting a few weights be um, free parameters. Mm -hmm. So it trains very fast. Mm -hmm. Even though they got the tags wrong. Uh, he has a question. I was actually wondering, uh, in, the, uh, in the score, did they uh, differentiate between culture and, ta uh, and uh, tag? Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, culture and tag. But between those two labels, did they differentiate? If you say um, that this is a label horses, 
Oh, sorry, uh, it's culture, horses, whatever, right? Uh -huh. So uh, would it differentiate? Would it be like an uh, uh, error? Uh, Is it positive or negative? Uh, if you say in culture, it, do, you, do you have to predict just label or you have to say this is a culture Italian and tag horses? You cannot say tag Italian and culture horses. You have to use the whole thing. You have to use the culture Italian. Yeah. Okay. Each of this has a in did, did anybody try to uh, build two different models for tag and culture? Like completely different models to do that. Uh -huh. Did they try to do that or not? Well, um, in the winning solution, um, at the final stage before he built a stack model, he did try to train only the tag labels. Is that what you are asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, again, um, I, I think that it uh, it makes sense to predict culture based on tags, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, basically, if you give a number of uh, those attributes as tags, that would be really great. Um, feature for uh, predicting culture. That, that's my okay. kind of thinking, and mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that would be the right <laughs> approach. Okay. So my, my question is kind of related, um, and it sounds like the answer is going to be no, just based on no one, no one even splitting it. But huh. when you had the, the image up of all the, different, all the different labels, and like some of them seemed like they had some redundancy, like American or European, and, okay. and then American and European. There, was there any discussion of kind of like making sure those labels kind of address that? Okay, uh, first of all, there are low duplicated labels. So it would not have one image assigned to American labels. Okay, so um, two labels being very similar, like American and European. Well, I guess they are very similar. Um, but, but that's what this um, fine green attribute recognition is about, right? You want to be able to um, dis, um, tell the difference between American and European. Right, so, but one of the labels in your example blurb was literally American or European. That was the uh, whole label. There was an Italian that I saw that too. Yeah, well, maybe there's one of those as well. And then, like, so, like, London and British, maybe if you had a lazy person that only put London, even yes. though you would assume that would also be, be British. Yes, I think you're right. And that's why um, people think that the culture labels, they are very noisy and not very consistent. And the other thing about this is, um, so um, they hire a bunch of annotators to label these images. And so, um, so sometimes the labels are not very good. Uh, okay, so they actually have a bunch of vocabularies for them to choose from. So they can go to this list and choose this label. But then they can also they can also add free form text, so they can like write a whole paragraph and say that's a label. And maybe that's how American or Spanish. Uh, how, that's why we have a label like that. Is is just some text that people added. Yeah, yeah. So let me just go back to that. Uh, it's not anywhere, but. Anyways, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes. So I, I think um, this competition, uh, there is an issue with the metric. I think something like uh, mean average uh, precision will be better. Okay. So there could be like multi-label instead of multi-classes. So you can just have percentages of uh, maybe partial membership in each class with varying partial memberships in each class. Yeah, so I think um, F score is not the ideal metric for this competition. Okay, okay. Well, usually for multi labels, they would use, they would use F one or F two score or something that at the very least based on precision and recall. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, with the culture labels, I imagine there's potentially a lot of structure and, and maybe hierarchy in how those labels get applied, like. Mm -hmm. Two cultures that are mm. on different parts of the world or very different in time mm -hmm. are unlikely to go together, but then other cultures will always go together. And some some cultures might be like subcultures of a, mm -hmm. a larger culture. So is any, anyone, did anyone make an attempt to learn structure in those labels or try and exploit it? 
Unfortunately, no one tried that, but I think that would be a very reasonable approach. Like they can apply some sort of, I don't know, language processing to the labels and figure out some structure to it. Mm. Uh, the, all these labels, they are from my oncology, but there are also free form tests, which is some just comments that the annotator thinks is appropriate for the image. Okay, so I, I just have a comment. So earlier uh, in the presentation, I asked maybe what the main motivation was behind this competition. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we discussed that there's a lot of noise in these labels, and it's probably quite difficult to get good quality labels mm -hmm. created. So this could actually be a method that they they can use to identify mm -hmm. pictures that were labeled incorrectly, right? Mm -hmm. So if the model is very confident on some of these labels that are mm -hmm. currently not existing there, then they can kind of go in and much more efficiently mm -hmm. fix the errors in the original labels. Then pseudo labeling actually makes sense. Then mm -hmm. pseudo labeling. Yeah, mm -hmm. I actually I actually have a very similar um, what but the question. Um, so in, in the photo you showed about the labels, um, it was actually like showing what region uh, the label uh, was was occupying on the, on the picture, like the mm -hmm. other one. Mm -hmm. The other one. The one. This I, one? This the one you oh, yeah this one. So it's showing like for example it's it's actually like highlighting the horse. But in the training data, it didn't tell you what region of the photo is occupying, right? Well, yeah, but it doesn't have to because that would be mm. object detection problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so mm. when you go to your Keras code, um, you have a you have a zoom feature that is potentially like oh, taking yeah. some of those features out of your uh -huh. training data. Uh -huh. I'm thinking actually some of the, the, the thing they are filtering out mm -hmm. is the stuff that have been actually cropped out, for example, from one of your, your images. Mm -hmm. And you are trying to somehow filter your mistake, your previous mistake there. Is that possible? Actually, one of your part, oh, oh, sorry, one of the participants mentioned that point too, because in data augmentation uh, for images, um, a lot of time people will apply crop. So they just cop the pictures, right? And they find out the exact problem that you just mentioned. If they apply cop, they cop away maybe like maybe the children. Yeah. So um, that's not and um, that's not so good. So in the end, um, they design like most people design not to go with crop, but maybe like shifting, rotating, and such. Mm -hmm. And David has a question. <laughs> yep. So it's more a comment. Um, I just wanted to, to add that I think part of the reason that the the, the culture of labels are, are so noisy and perhaps not so useful is because they're not particularly precise. Mm -hmm. So what, what I mean by that is basically they just go, they just say French or Italian or Egyptian or something like that, mm -hmm. whereas French or Italian or Egyptian works mm -hmm. through time have varied quite significantly in their styles. Mm -hmm. Like the example that you provided on like one of the first slides was of that um, mm -hmm. statue which looked Greek but turned out to be Egyptian. And uh -huh. the reason for that would probably be because it was from the Ptolemaic era of the Egyptian dynasties, So, which, under which point they had a lot of Greek influences in their culture. So that's okay. extremely different, an extremely different Egyptian from the, the Egyptian of the, the old or the middle of the new kingdoms. Um, uh -huh. which is more what we tend to think of as Egyptian. That's um, a very good point, actually. I don't remember seeing the labels, uh, seeing a label that indicate um, the time period of the artifact. But I imagine that has to be somewhere right, like Middle Ages or something. But I didn't look into that. But that's a very good point. It's true. Like ancient Egypt will be very different from nowadays Egypt. Yeah. Okay, um, actually, so I might just make one more comment. Sorry, everybody. Um, so at, at a lot of these Kaggle presentations, we always see that the stacked model was always involved in, uh, and, and Kevin pointed out, the, you know, a, a huge ensemble of many different models. Um, and it's always involved in the winning solutions. Uh, and you asked earlier if that's a good approach. Yeah, a stacked, stacked model or stacked ensemble is probably the best way of ensembling models together. But we've never really gone into detail on kind of how exactly you would do that. And, and I had to come across this at work. And I've there's a couple of gotchas when you're making a stacked model that I might just quickly go over. So 
One of the key concepts is whenever you're training a machine learning model, it's always going to eventually start to try to memorize some of your data that's not really generalizable to kind of um, out of training data records that you need to predict on. And so when you're training your level two models, so when you're training uh, the model that takes in other models' uh, outputs as inputs, it's very important that the that the inputs to that level two model comes from uh, records that that level one model had not seen. So it has to be the validation set from the level one models that's used as the training set for level two models. And so immediately, uh, a lot of people might think that you're going to lose a lot of samples because you're using a subset of your data. But what you can do is you can just create five different folds of your original data set. So you, so you, you train five, like let the five is just an example. So you'll train five different models, all the exact same model on different um, folds of your data. And then you'll create a whole new data set that just contains out of um, training Prediction, like out of sample predictions from your level one model, and then you can use that into your level two model. So that was kind of one gotcha that I had to figure out, and it's a little bit tricky to avoid um, kind of leakage in this situation. But that's that's the strategy that most people use. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. So uh, yeah, we're almost finished. We're just gonna. I'm gonna. I do that at the end. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. Yeah, great job.